Hey everyone, it's good to be with you today. My name is Dr. Mikey Mewborn, and today we're looking at the unity and community of the body or in the body. You know, the Bible talks a lot about being part of the body of Christ. It's referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it speaks to us that we have a certain function or a certain role, maybe even a certain task task that God has called us to as a believer. And that's special because God has given us the gifts to perform or to actually fulfill those roles that God has called us to. And so it is a joy to be a part of the body of Christ, but also we have a job to fulfill. And so I want you to know as we look at this lesson today, and and I hope that you would give it get a better understanding. What does it mean for me to fulfill that role that God has called me to? And so pay attention to those things as we get started in this lesson. We'll see you on the backside. God bless you. Hello, this is Church Ministry, and today we're looking at unity and community in the body. We're getting our outline notes from Kenneth Gingle's book, Team Leadership. Um, Just the notes throughout this, you'll see them pop up, and a lot of times I'll try to put them in um, an italicized form so that you can kind of see the difference. But anyway, it's good to be with you today. Today, Let's go ahead and jump into our notes. What do you think is the greatest problem facing our churches today? I think that's a, that's a wonderful question to look at as we get started into this lesson. Is it militant liberalism? As in anything goes, let's, hey, all things to all people in the sense that Anybody can do whatever they want to, and and we've got to force that and push that into the mainstream uh, idea of Christianity. All, is it immature believers, people not knowing what they should be doing? It's people making constant mistakes or common mistakes, and immature believers really don't look any differently than the than a lost person does in many cases. And so there's no differences between the church and the leader, uh, the church and those who are not in the church. Issues of ecclesiology. Uh, We think about the idea of the church world. And if we want to look at how the church functions, also what is the polity of the church or what is the government of the church, the structures, and are there problems there that cause the greatest problems for the church? Is it leadership struggles? Is it the idea that we have people messing up left and right or defecting from the church, pulling away, breaking apart? Or is it ungodly teaching? The idea that there's been so much teaching in the world today and so many books and and people are writing for Lifeway all the time or they're writing for some kind of publisher company and and so they're writing for them and they're posting it and there's blogs going out. And there's all types of teaching with social media that's going everywhere, but is it ungodly or is it incorrect? Um, what about materialism? It's this name it and claim it type of mentality that's, uh, there's a phrase for it, blab it and grab it theology, um, meaning that I get whatever I, whatever I want, and if I have enough faith, I'll get anything that I want. And some people call that the prosperity gospel. It's the idea I sh- that I should never get sick, that there should be no pain or suffering in the world if people would just be right and live right, um, or uh, they might, you could have anything that you want, um, but materialistically, I guess you would say, if you just had enough faith. And so all kinds of things. So what's the greatest problem facing our churches when it comes to unity and community? I thought this was interesting. Top concerns. This is from Lifeway, Facts and Trends. And I thought this was very interesting. Top concern about the future of their church, according to Protestant pastors, reaching the next generation. They say that's the biggest problem. The lack of discipleship is a lot lower than that. Declining interest in matters of faith, a lack of member commitment. None of these. Changing community demographics, finances of our church, public distrust, Christian churches, hostility toward Christian beliefs, and then don't know. Um, I think this is interesting. So if you think about this, this is what the pastors of churches are thinking. So they're thinking we're not reaching the next generation. Maybe you've heard this before. we got to get more young families into churches. Well, when they're saying that, they're also saying we are not reaching the younger generation. And then sometimes vice versa. You have guys or people that are reaching the younger generation, but they're not reaching the adults 
or the senior adult generation that that's it's almost like they've been avoided and so they find themselves falling out of church it's amazing the people that are leaving the church these days um, there's a tremendous amount of senior adults leaving the church because they feel like it's not for them as much anymore. So you've got young families not even coming into the church in most many cases, and then you've got a lot of senior adults leaving the church. Um, it's not that they're leaving the faith per se. They would never say that, but they would say, yes, I'm, I'm leaving the structure of the church. I can watch it online from my house or I can watch it on TV. And so there's all kinds of concerns for the church that we have to consider. When we're looking at unity and community in the body. So as we look at the six characteristics of most churches, we see that that they are spiritual vitality, uh, doctrinal instruction, the word of God being taught, fellowship, observance of the Lord's Supper, um, number five, prayer is a big part of it, and then Christian testimony. These are the six characteristics that I, I believe and, um, and that probably most people believe these are the characteristics of most churches. You've got to have doctrinal preaching or you've got to have some form of preaching and teaching. You have to have the fellowship where people are coming together for a common purpose to glorify the Lord God Almighty. You're going to have Christ. He needs to be the the, the empowerment or the power behind what everything we do. So I'm talking about the Spirit of Christ there, the, the Holy Spirit. Then you're going to need prayer. You're going to need the ordinances depending on church setup and all that. And then Christian testimony, meaning that people are testifying that God is working. The, these are the characteristics of a healthy church. A vital, uh, the vital signs are where they should be for the healthy church. Now, I, I found an interesting, um, a separate type of uh, uh, sermon series here, um, and this is a sermon series of what not to do. So, ten characteristics of a narcissistic church, meaning it's. Us. It's all about us. It's all focused inside. Well, what am I about? What do I look like? And it's, um, and th that can be very dangerous. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting sermon series that came up. Uh, as we continue on, um, I want us to look at a passage in First Peter chapter two five. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, if you see this first phrase here, first line, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. What does that mean? Well, as we've looked at before, that Jesus Christ is the ultimate cornerstone, what we're doing is we're being stacked upon him. And what that's doing is it's creating his church, his kingdom. Sometimes we love to talk about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a very unique phrase. It's referring to the already but not yet type of kingdom. So has the kingdom of God already come? Yes. Has it fully uh has it been fully realized in, in all that it is? No. So, it, yes, it's already here, but not yet. Not fully manifested, I guess you would say. And so what, what he's telling us in this is that we are like living stones. This idea that we are part of the same stuff that, of course, is that Christ is made up of. And that is his nature, and that is of his spirit, and that is of his goodness. And of course, the fruits of the spirit are, and the gifts of the spirit have been given to us. And so that's important that we know that. And so we are living stones that God is putting together for his glory. I thought this was neat too. Talking about the royal family, this is later on, First Peter chapter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, I want you to see this real quick. Holy nation, all right? Now, that is neat because this is talking about a group of people that set aside, a group of people that are that are separate, they're different. The idea of chosen race is the same thing. It's it's that they are uh, they have a special calling on their lives, a special unique um, aspect about them. And what is unique about them? Well, they have the spirit of God. 
What's unique about them is they have a new heart. What's unique, they have a new nature. So they are part of something bigger. They're part of an actual priesthood. Everybody in Christ are part of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being the high priest, as Hebrews tells us clearly. And then what we see here is that we are a part of that. That means that we live a certain way. We act a certain way. And what are priests known for? Serving. They're known for putting up sacrifices. They're the ones known for being where they need to be. They're the ones known for eating the certain types of food and drinking the certain types of things. They're known for looking different than everybody else and having a different calling upon themselves. And what God is saying here is that you are a part of this, so we are to serve one another and help one another and care for one another. And so that's the idea that's going on there. All right. So then you see this, the body metaphor and uh, Gengel's notes, first Corinthians 12, 12, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body. So it is with Christ. First Corinthians 12, 18 through 20. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So there's the body metaphor. There's, a, there's one body, but many different parts, and each person that's in the body of Christ plays a role in that, in the in the whole, I guess you would say. And so uh, I think it's easily explained in this these next two phrases. God has a place for everyone in the church. So God has a place. Number two, everyone's place is very important to the church. So God has a place for everyone, but there's nobody that, that doesn't have purpose. There's nobody out there that God hasn't gifted in some way or another. Everybody has a place in the church, and then everyone's place is very important to the church. So your job as a believer is vital to the church. So that's important as well. So that's the body metaphor playing into itself there. Then the broken body. I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You see something similar in Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. The idea is, is that when people suffer, and they will, they will be persecuted. They will go through pains of life. They will go through trials and tribulation. As they go through those things, the whole church suffers with them. The whole church suffers with them. If there's a, a loved one that passes away within the church, think of this. You know, not long ago, I saw that um, a, 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 a lady and her husband, who I've known for a lot of years, um, they lost their little three-year-old baby. Now, you might think, wow, how do you deal with that? Well, I'll tell you what's happened is the whole church has gathered around that family. And because they are suffering, truly suffering, that whole church has just, just rallied around them, gathered around them, providing them with meals, loving them, sending them cards, doing everything and anything they can to love that family because they're suffering as they are. And so I, I want you to think about that. Uh, I love what Galatians 6.10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. He's saying there that, okay, yes, be kind, be nice, be generous to all all peoples, but especially focus in and be intentional uh, to to helping those of the household of faith. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Now, why do I say that? Well, because churches are like this idea of chains that they work together in unity to strengthen and to pull and do the things that they need to do. But if you are a weak link then you cause a lot of problems within that church. So it's important that we uphold our end of the bargain. Now, let's talk just for a moment about people-centered ministry. Um, the idea of people-centered ministry, I, I like this kind of quote for myself. Preach exclusively that Jesus Christ only is Lord. Outreach inclusively, meaning come one, come everybody, come all. Come and drink. Come, you, you who thirst, come. 
For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And so you outreach ex inclusively, but you preach the exclusive message of Jesus Christ. So it's people-centered ministry. The gift of leading. Leadership is often developed. Spiritual gifts of leadership are revealed. In other words, if God gives you, you're in the household of faith, and God gives you a a gift that's very unique to you, say it's teaching, something like that, well then he's going to show you that. He's going to reveal that to you and say this is what you're to be doing. But leadership in general can easily be developed and we can work through that, those types of things. I believe you should always be bringing other people up underneath you um, and pointing them to Christ. Requirement of biblical lifestyle. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. That means this. If we're, we don't believe it in our heart and it's not who we are, then it's not really going to come out of our life. It's not really going to come out. It's not going to show itself. And then understanding personal encounters. Effective communicators listen well and speak intentionally. Think about that. Effective communicators listen well and speak intentionally. You can say the same thing about leaders in general. They listen very well, and then they speak intentionally. Okay? All right. Well, it's good to be with you today. This has been Unity and Community in the Body. Um, God bless you. Continue on with your studies, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. Well, that was the lesson on unity and community. I hope you paid attention to a few of the things that are just important for the Christian life, being a part of a holy nation, a part of this royal priesthood that, that God has um, put us into and that we are part of, that we've been set apart for God's, um, for his glory and for all that he has for us. And so I hope you kind of dug in on some of the things such as about the part about the broken body. Now, what does that mean? Well, when the body of Christ is uh, is rejoicing, we should rejoice. But when they're suffering, we should bear down with them. We should help them. We should work alongside them and do all that we can to take care of them. So it's very important that we pay attention to what God has given us through the body of Christ. But how do we fulfill our role? Anyways, good to be with you today. Hope you have a great rest of the day and God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.